down the ages past, Allah sent his messengers to deliver humankind from darkness to light. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. That's also the ongoing mission of Islamic Research Foundation or IRF, spreading the truth of Allah's final message to mankind. Founded in 1991, IRF today offers some of the best services and facilities in the world for presenting an understanding of Islam in an objective and scientific way. Its programs are primarily focused on correcting misconceptions and promoting understanding of Islam. IRF also imparts Dawa training to Dais to aptly convey the message of Islam. IRF has one of the most modern studios producing programs presenting Islam, which are beamed regularly on many international TV channels in over 150 countries. Dr. Zakir Naik, president of IRF, reaching out across countries worldwide, from America to Europe to Africa to Asia to Australia, strives to clarify Islamic viewpoints. He dispels the many media myths and anti-Islamic prejudices propagated the world over by anti-Islamic forces. Dr. Zakir Naik is a medical doctor. He is acclaimed the world over for his spontaneous and convincing replies to questions posed by critics and skeptics during the question and answer sessions after his talks. He is also renowned for his verbatim quotes with references from major religious scriptures of the world. Dr. Zakir and other faculty of the IRF train many Dais in effective Dawa techniques. IRF's website provides free Dawa training material for you to download and become an effective Dai yourself. Dr. Zakir Naik's talks are available on audio and video, cassettes, CDs and DVDs the world over. IRF today is creating a change in the hearts and minds of millions of Muslims and non-Muslims worldwide towards a proper understanding and respect for Islam. Have a question or doubt about Islam and its teachings? Now you know, one of the best resource centers to get convincing answers from is Islamic Research Foundation. 5658 Tandil Street, North Dongri, Mumbai, 400009, India. Phone 2373-6875. Fax 9122-2373-0689. Email islam at the rate of irf.net. For more information, log on to our website www.irf.net. We start our program with a recital from the Quran by a young Kari, Fayyaz Ahmed.
delivering lectures on various islamic talks and comparative religion the list is exhaustive now i would like to hand over the stage and the further proceedings from here to brother ilyas sheikh he'll conduct the proceedings from here on jazakallah respected elders brothers and sisters i greet you all with the islamic greeting Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Almighty Allah be on all of you. Let me now introduce you to our guest speaker today, Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir Naik, the president of the Islamic Research Foundation, is a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the main driving spirit, alhamdulillah, behind the Islamic Research Foundation getting worldwide acclaim. For the proper presentation, understanding, and clarification on Islam, as well as removing misconceptions about Islam. Though a medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to spread the real truth of Islam, especially to the millions of English-speaking audiences throughout the world. At only 33 years of age, Dr. Zakir explains the teachings of Islam and clears misconceptions with convincing answers to challenging questions posed by members of the audience and skeptics in question and answer sessions that follow his, that regularly follow his programs. He has also delivered more than 200 public talks in the last two years alone in the United States of America, Canada, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, and Sri Lanka, and Malaysia. In addition to many public talks in India itself, he has also participated in symposiums with prominent personalities of other faiths. Dr. Zakir has appeared on various international TV shows, satellite television programs in the United States of America, Malaysia, India, and so on. He has appeared on interactive radio talk shows in the United States of America, South Africa, and several other countries. He's regularly quizzed and interviewed by media worldwide, especially on topics like why Islam conflicts with women's rights, with human rights, with modern science and secularism. But his dynamic resolve to dispel media myths about Islam with facts, specific references, and dynamic resolve and proper context stand out to rectify or neutralize the prejudice or media bias that are based on unwarranted presumptions and conclusions. More than 100 Dr. Zakir's lectures and debates and symposia are available on video and audio cassettes. He has authored books on Islam and comparative religion. I now call upon Brother Zakir Naik to take the mic and deliver the talk on today's topic. If the label shows your intent, wear it.
الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام و رسول اللہ و اعلیٰ و صاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و ادا جا عقل لذینہ یؤمنون بے آیاتینہ فقل سلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و ادا خوئی تم بے تہیتم فہیو بے حسن منہا اور دوہا ان اللہ کان علاق الشین حسیبہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربش وحلی صدری و سرلی عمری وحل العقد تملسانی یف کہ کولی ریسپیکٹڈ چیئرمین بردر الیاس مائی ریسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرس اینڈ مائی ڈیئر بردر اینڈ سسٹرس آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگس السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. And the topic I have chosen for this morning's talk is if the label shows your intent, wear it. It is rather an unusual topic. People may wonder that what has the label got to do with Islam or the Muslims? people are rather curious that what will be the content of this talk. It's rather an unusual topic. I start my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 54, which says, وَإِذَا جَاءَقَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِا آیاتینہ فقل سلام علیکم اینڈ وین دھوز کم ٹو دھی ہو بلیو ان آور سائنس ٹیل پیس بی آن یو اٹ مینس دیٹ وین ایور اے مومن وین ایور اے مسلم کمس ٹو یو یو شوڈ سے السلام علیکم مے پیس بی آن یو اٹس کمپلسری دیٹ وین ایور اے مسلم میٹس این ادر مسلم Whenever a moment meets another moment, he should say, Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. It's compulsory. The other verse I quoted was from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 86, which says, Wa iza huyitum bi tahiyatin fahayyu bi hasana minha aw rudduha inna allaha kana ala kulli shayin hasiba which means that when a courteous greeting is offered to you, meet it with a greeting still more courteous, or at least the same. And Allah is careful in keeping accounts of all things. That means whenever any person greets you, you should greet him with a greeting which is more courteous or at least of equal courtesy. It's compulsory. For example, if suppose someone wishes you assalamu alaikum, you should wish back wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If someone says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you should wish back wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Or if someone says, Assalamu Alaikum, you can even reply, Wa Alaikum Assalam. The words are the same, but it is coming from within the heart, from the depths of the heart, from the bottom of the heart. The words are the same, but it is still a more courteous greeting. Wa Alaikum Assalam. Or if someone says, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu. And if you cannot improve on that, at least say, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu. Minimum of equal courtesy. But there are many Muslims who own companies, who have got various employees under them. And when the employees, when they wish them, Assalamu Alaikum, they either nod, or they murmur, wa alaikum salam. Some even don't care to reply. These Muslims, they are going against the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran. In Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 86, it says, you should 
wish back more courteously or at least wish back with equal courtesy. He's greeted back the person with equal courtesy. It's minimum. Let's analyze the various types of greetings that we have in the society. And the most common of all the greetings in English, we say, good morning. In Afrikaans, people say, Khuyumara, Asagabana. In Chinese, Chao Sun. In most of the languages, it's a very common greeting, good morning. And suppose it's a rainy day, it's raining cats and dogs. And if someone wishes you good morning, what is so good about that morning? It's raining cats and dogs, the city is flooded, and yet you say good morning. What is so good about that morning? And when we go to school, and if you're studying in English school, every period in the beginning of the day, in the morning, when the teacher enters, all the students wish the teacher, good morning, sir. It's compulsory. And maybe the teacher, before he left his house, maybe he had a fight with his wife early in the morning. He may be cursing that morning in his heart. He may be praying that never should such a morning ever come in his life. But in spite of this, when the students wish, good morning, sir, he has to reply, good morning. Even though from the depth of his heart, he may never wish that such a morning should come again, yet he replies by good morning. What is so good about that morning in which a person has a fight with his spouse? The best form of greeting is the Islam greeting. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. Irrespective whether it's a rainy day, whether it's raining cats and dogs, whether you had a fight with your spouse or with your friend, yet the greeting, assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you, is the most appropriate. We have another form of greeting, especially among the young people who go to schools and colleges. When they wish their friend, they say hi. And if a young friend wishes to his friend across the street, hi, the friend will reply, hi! And when you ask him, what is the meaning of hi, no one will be able to reply. What is the meaning of hi? No one will be able to reply. In Hindi, that's the local language out here, hi is a form of disgust, you know, hi. And in English, with H-I-G-H, hi means something which is on a height. And another meaning of hi is a slang word for a person who's intoxicated. And people say, I went to the party and I got high, I got drunk, I got intoxicated. Is it a courteous greeting? In fact, I say it is not a greeting at all. Leave aside it being a courteous greeting, high is not a greeting at all. The other common greeting, which most of us use, is hello. And if we look up in the Oxford Dictionary, the meaning of hello, it says an informal greeting. And the other meaning given in the Oxford Dictionary is that to begin a telephonic conversation, to begin a talk, to start a talk on the telephone. Do you know how did this idea come about that to start a telephonic conversation you should say hello? The person who invented the telephone was Sir Alexander Graham Bell. And once, when he was leaving his house in a hurry, the bell rang. And to initiate an early response, he said hello. So that he can greet the person, and the person responds fast, and he can go out of the house soon. This word hello, to start a telephonic conversation, has stuck since that time, and even today, everyone uses it. You use it, and when I use it. Hello to start a telephonic conversation. But nowadays, especially in Bombay, thanks to the MTNL, 
that the word hello is used more often in between a conversation. Because when the sound goes low, you say, hello, can you hear me, hello? The Oxford Dictionary says, hello is used to start a telephone conversation. But in Bombay, it's used more in between the talk than in the beginning of the talk. And since the time the mobile has been invented, and when the area of reception is not very clear, you have to use the word hello even in between the telephone conversation. So maybe in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, they may change the meaning hello can also be used in between a telephonic conversation. I fail to realize that why does the Western world use any other form of greeting than the one used by Jesus, peace be upon him? Why do the Westerners, especially the Christians, use any other form of greeting than the one used by Jesus, peace be upon him? And if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, that after the Alish crucifixion, when Jesus, peace be upon him, goes to the upper room to meet the disciples, he wishes them in Hebrew, Shalom Alaikum. If you translate the Hebrew into Arabic, it means Assalamu Alaikum. And if you translate into English, it means may peace be on you. The best and the most universal form of any greeting is Assalamu Alaikum. May peace be on you. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad peace be upon him, was always the first person to greet the people. Many of the Sahabas, many of the companions of the beloved Prophet, on many occasions, they tried to be the first person to greet, but they failed. The Prophet, alhamdulillah, was always the first person to greet. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, in the book of Salam, chapter number 901, hadith number 5374, Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the rider should first greet the pedestrian. The pedestrian should first greet the person who's standing. A smaller group should first greet the larger group. That means if a person is riding on an animal like horse, etc., or a camel, or if he is traveling in a vehicle, like a car or a motorcycle, he should be the first person to greet the person who is walking on the streets. That's a pedestrian. A pedestrian should be the first person who should greet a person who's standing or sitting. Similarly, a smaller group should first greet the larger group. It's further mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, in the book of As Salam. Chapter number 903, hadith number 5378, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, he says that the Prophet said that it is the right of every Muslim on his brother, it is the right of every Muslim on his brother that he replies to a salutation. Whenever anyone says, Assalamu Alaikum, he should reply, Wa alaikum as -salam, minimum. There are minimum five rights of a Muslim on his brother. The first is replying to a salutation. And it continues that saying, Ya Haramakullah, when someone sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah. Visiting a person when he's sick and following the funeral procession. These are the five rights of a Muslim over his brother. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also said that a younger person should first greet a person who's elder. A person coming down the flight of stairs should first greet a person who's going up the flight of stairs. These are the teachings of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, how is it possible for any Muslim 
to follow the commandments of the beloved prophet as well as how is it possible to follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is mentioned in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 54 which says that وَإِذَا جَاءَ قَلَّ ذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِعَيَاتِينَ فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ That when those come to thee who believe in our signs wish them as-salamu alaykum how is it possible for us to follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beloved prophet unless you recognize that the person in front of you is a Muslim? How is it possible for me to recognize that this particular human being believes in the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless I recognize that he is a Muslim or he is a Mormon? Usually, when you attend a conference, the delegates, they wear a label or they wear a badge on which is mentioned the name of the delegate and his designation or the place where he comes from. If it's a conference of intellectuals, maybe the profession is mentioned, whether he's a doctor or an engineer or an advocate if it's a conference of specialists in the field of medicine, the speciality is mentioned. Whether he's a cardiologist, a heart specialist. Whether he's a neurologist, a brain specialist. Whether he's a urologist, a specialist of the kidney. Whether he's a gynecologist, a specialist in the disease of the woman. Whether he's a pediatrician, a specialist of the children. The speciality of that person is mentioned. This badge or a label which the delegates wear, it's a sort of an informal introduction. If you want to ask any question about the heart, you'll ask a cardiologist. If you want to know about something about the brain, some latest advances, you'll go and approach a neurologist. If you want to know something about the treatment of the disease of the children, you'll approach a pediatrician. This batch is a sort of an informal introduction. It's a requirement that every Muslim should also have a label. For example, I'm wearing a batch, I have a label, on which is mentioned Allah. Any person, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, when he sees this batch, even if he cannot read Arabic, he will realize it is something in Arabic, and he'll immediately realize that this person is a Muslim. It's an informal introduction, introducing myself that I'm a Muslim. There are various other batches available, and we have a great variety in the Islamic Research Foundation, batches mentioning La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah that there's no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We have batches mentioning Quran is the word of God for universal guidance. When a person sees the batch, a non-Muslim, he may also be inquisitive that, what is this batch you're wearing? What does it mean Allah? And you have an opportunity to do da'wah. He may ask that Quran, the word of God, what is this Quran? An opportunity to talk. It's not possible for all the Muslims in Ummah to wear a badge like the one I'm wearing. It's difficult. It's not freely available. And it's also expensive. Therefore, I wouldn't say that everyone should wear a badge. And neither do I wear a badge always. I don't wear this badge always. Just a few times. Not always. When I wear the coat, I wear a badge. Not always. It's not practical that every Muslim should wear such a badge. Why don't we Muslims wear a label which is being worn since ages and it's already there in our community? Since ages. I'm referring to the beard and the cap. That why don't we Muslims wear the label that is sport a beard and wear a cap? There may be many Muslim brothers of mine who may ask me that, Brother Zakir, 
what does the cap and the beard have to do with Islam? Do I have to wear a cap and sport a beard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize that I'm a Muslim? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to recognize any human being, whether he's a Muslim or not, he doesn't require us to wear a cap or sport a beard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ilm again. He has the knowledge. If you deserve Jannah, heaven, Allah will give it to you. If you deserve Jahannam, hell, Allah will give it to you. Allah doesn't require a person to wear the cap or sport a beard to recognize whether you're a Muslim or not. But the question I ask, that how will I as Muslim, who doesn't have ilm gab will recognize whether the person in front of me, whether he's a Muslim or not? How will I recognize? How will I follow the commandments of the glory of Quran in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 54 that whenever those come to thee who believe in our signs, whenever the moments approach you, whenever the Muslims approach you, wish them assalamu alaikum. How can I follow this guidance unless I recognize that the person in front of me is a Muslim or not? People may ask me, that brother Zakir, is it a fard? Is it compulsory to keep a beard and wear a cap? I have not come across a single verse in the glorious Quran which says that it is a fard to keep a beard. There's not a single verse in the glorious Quran. The only place where the Quran mentions about the beard is in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 94, which says, Qala abna umma. He said, Aaron, peace be upon him, tells his elder brother, Moses, peace be upon him, he said, that, O oh, son of my mother, la taqhuz bilihyati wala birasa. Don't hold me by my beard or by the hair on my head. This is the only verse in the glorious Quran which mentions the word beard. Aaron, peace be upon him, tells his elder brother Moses, peace be upon him, when he gets angry, that don't hold me by my beard or by the hair on my head, indicating that Harun alayhi salam, Aaron peace be upon him, had a beard. That's all. This verse doesn't say that it's compulsory for every Muslim to keep a beard. But the glorious Quran says in several places, Atiullah was your Rasul. In several places. In Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 32. In Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 132. In Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 59. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 92. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 1. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 20. In Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 46. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 54. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 56. In Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 33. In Surah Mujadila, chapter number 58, verse number 13. In several places, including Surah Taqaboon, chapter number 64, verse number 12, the glorious Quran says, Atiullah, what's your Rasul? Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. It's compulsory that every Muslim should obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven. In the book of dress, chapter number 64, hadith number 780, Nafi, may Allah be pleased with him, he narrated that Ibn Umar, the son of Umar, said that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that do the opposite of what the pagans do. Keep the beard and cut the mustaches short. It's a commandment of the beloved Prophet that keep the beard and cut the mustaches short. It's further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of dress, chapter number 65, hadith number 781, that Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he narrates that the messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, said that cut your mustaches short and leave your beard. Most of the scholars say that keeping a beard is mustahab. Mustahab means highly recommended. Or some people say, sunnat-e-mawqadah. 
it's a highly recommended sunnah of the beloved prophet. While there are many other scholars who say that because the Quran says, Atiullah, Ati Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messenger, any commandment of the messenger becomes a fard on every Muslim. So there are many scholars who say that keeping a beard is fard. Many scholars say it is mustahab, highly recommended, while some scholars say, many others say that it is a fard because it's an amar, it's a commandment of the beloved prophet. Any commandment of the beloved prophet becomes a fard on every Muslim. But any Muslim, if he's a true Muslim, irrespective whether it's mustahab or a fard, he will keep a beard. There are many Muslims on whose face the beard will suit very well if they have a good growth. There are many Muslims on whose face the beard may not suit. I remember the first time when I kept a beard, when I was studying in the medical college, and my growth was very sparse. Even now, it's not thick. It is the same. But previously, it was more sparse. You know, just a few hair here and there. So when I started keeping a beard, one of our Muslim brothers said, MashaAllah, you have a nurani chara. The beard has thrown light on your face, and the beard suits you. What the Muslim brother was trying to do was to encourage me that I should continue keeping the beard, alhamdulillah. But I knew that as far as looks is concerned, the beard did not suit me. You know, just few hairs here and few hairs here and a few hairs there. It didn't suit me. Even now, after so many years, it has grown a bit, alhamdulillah. But not like many of us people who have got a good growth, alhamdulillah. I had a sparse growth. But I have a logic, and I say that those Muslims who have a good growth, and if the beard suits them and they keep the beard, inshallah, they will get the sawab because they're being Allah and his messenger. But those Muslims who don't have a good growth, and if the beard doesn't suit them, and yet if they keep the beard to follow Allah and his Rasul, inshallah, they will get more sawab. Because imagine, even though the beard doesn't suit me, if the beard doesn't suit a Muslim, yet he keeps for the love of Allah and his Rasul. I consider that inshallah, he will get more sawab. All those who keep the beard will get the sawab, but the person on whom the beard doesn't suit, and yet he keeps it, knowing very well it doesn't suit him, for the love of Allah and his Rasul, he will get multiple times more sawab. Normally, if you analyze that all the human beings who keep a beard, if you take a survey, approximately more than three-fourths of the men who sport a beard, they are Muslims. More than 75% of the men who sport the beard, they are Muslims. Maybe about 25%, maybe non-Muslims. But those non-Muslims who sport a beard, they may have a typical type of beard, you know, with the mustache curled up, so you can make out that he's not a Muslim, or may have a particular type of beard resembling some other personality indicating that this is not an Islamic type of beard. Or he may wear an additional sign, like a tika worn by the Hindus, or wear a cross, the sign of the Christians. So most of the time, when the non-Muslims, when they keep a beard, depending upon the type of the beard, or the sign that they're wearing, a cross or a tika, you can identify that though this person has a beard, he is a non-Muslim. So when you meet a person, Sporting a beard, majority of the time, more than 95% of the time, you can identify whether this person is a Muslim or not. And for additional, for additional assurance, we have another label. I'm referring to the cap. People may ask me that is this a fard to wear a cap? There is no verse in the glorious Quran saying that it's a fard to wear a cap. Neither did our prophet said that it's a fard to wear a cap. So I wouldn't say it's a fard. But it is a sunnah. And if you read Sai Bukhari, form number seven, in the book of dress, 
chapter number 16, it's mentioned according to Ibn Abbas that the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came, he wore a black turban. The Prophet, whenever he went out, he always covered the head, unless he was in a state of ahram, he always covered the head. According to Anas bin Malik, he said that when the Prophet came out, he covered the head with a part of his garment. Further, if you read in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of dress, chapter number 17, hadith number 699, Anas bin Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that in the year of the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet entered Mecca, he was wearing a helmet. The Prophet always covered his head. So it is a sunnah to cover your head, whether it be with a piece of cloth or like a head covering with the Arabs wear or a cap. And the muhaddis, those who are experts in the knowledge of hadith, if they have to verify whether the rawi, whether the person who narrated is a sikha, is true or not, many of the muhaddis who are staunch, they do not regard the hadith of a narrator who did not cover his head. Because if a narrator did not cover his head, the staunch muhaddis say, we will not accept his hadith. So imagine it is a sunnah to cover the head. And the cap, it is so cheap. It is so cheap. You know, hardly costs about 10 rupees, 15 rupees or 20 rupees. The one that I am wearing, it's made in China, costs about 25 rupees. It's a harmless thing. It cannot even hurt a fly. It is so harmless. But it can do wonders. It can do wonders. And I normally keep on traveling. Alhamdulillah. I keep on traveling in various parts of the world. And people, when they see me, especially when I go to the Western country, who is this man, you know, fine-looking man, wearing a coat, coat and trousers, and wearing a cap? It looks a bit funny. And many people who aren't aware, they ask, what is this cap? So I tell him, it's the sign. It's my label. I'm a Muslim. Oh, you're a Muslim. An opportunity to dawah, which is a farz in Islam, an opportunity. People wonder, what is this person, you know, wearing a funny type of headgear? They come and approach you. They are giving you an opportunity to open your mouth. It does wonders. People start respecting you, alhamdulillah. It's a harmless thing. It can't even hurt a fly, but it does wonders. And suppose you're working in office, which is being owned by a non-Muslim, and if suppose he does not like you wearing the cap. It's very easy. Take it out and keep it in your pocket. But the moment the office time is over, you can wear your cap back. It's your right. He's only paying you for eight or ten hours that you're working for him. But the moment you come out, you can wear the cap. It's preferable to wear it always, but suppose you have a certain problem that you have to work in that office, and if it doesn't allow you, no problem. Take out the cap and keep it in the pocket. It does wonders. You know, when we go to the mosque, alhamdulillah, we see that the majority of the Muslims, they wear the cap, alhamdulillah. But when they come out, most of them put it in the pocket. Why? What's the problem? Are you afraid to identify yourself with Muslims outside? Are you afraid? What are you afraid of? In the mosque, alhamdulillah, you wear the cap. But when you come out, you put the label in your pocket. See, in the mosque, people recognize you're a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, you should even wear it there. But when you come out, why do you keep it in your pocket? And if you ask your grandparents, and those elderly people, they will tell you that people respected this label, the cap and the beard. And the non-Muslims, very often, when they wanted to hire a taxi, a cab, they searched for a driver who wore a cap and a beard. You know, so that, oh, oh, these are Muslims, you know, they're honest people. They will not 
cheat us. They will not take us for a ride. And if you have to purchase something from a shop, they prefer going to a shop which was owned by a person sporting a beard and wearing a cap. Ah, they will not cheat us. They will weigh the material correctly. The label had the respect. But nowadays, if you are wearing a cap and sporting a beard, oh, you are coming from Bhindi Bazaar, from Dongri. Ah, this person may be a gunda, you know. He may be a hooligan. It's a shame that we Muslims, we are to blame. We have spoiled the respect of our label. And it is true that there are some Muslims who misuse this label and they try and show that they're macho, you know. Oh, we are brave. Wearing a cap and putting a beard, Mia Bai. Want to Dadagiri. Want to go around and show that we are macho. There are a few of us who have spoiled the name. Therefore, many Muslims say that, see, I don't want to wear a cap and sport a beard, otherwise he'll think that I'm a gunda, I'm a hooligan. Therefore, I don't want to wear the cap or the beard. You know, people argue. So I tell them, because of a mistake of few of the Muslim brothers who have spoiled the labels, why should we ourselves stop respecting the label? Even if I agree with you, for sake of argument, that every person wearing a cap and sporting a beard is not a good person, for sake of argument, what I tell a Muslim brothers. At least you be the first person who starts wearing a cap and sporting a beard and say, I don't know about the other people, at least I am a Muslim who wears the label, has a cap, sports a beard, and I'm a good Muslim. I'm a good human being. I don't cheat. I don't tell lies. I don't bribe. I'm a good Muslim. You at least be the first person to initiate. Tomorrow there'll be 10 people, there'll be 100 people, there'll be 1,000 people, and inshallah, once again, the respect for the label, the cap and the beard, will be restored. We cannot give this argument, oh, you know, because, you know, if we wear the label, people think that we are bad, we are hooligans. We have to change the society. We have to bring back the respect which our label has lost. And there are many Muslims who are apologetic, who are afraid to identify themselves as Muslims. You know why? That if they wear the label, wear a cap and sport the beard, the people may ask the question, ah, you are the same Muslim who's allowed to marry more than one wife. Ah, oh, you are the same Muslim who is circumcised. Ah, the same Muslim who does not have alcohol, who keeps the woman in the veil, who subjugates the woman. So they're afraid to identify themselves as Muslims. I'm asking a question that if the area is notorious, an area which is notorious, there are gangsters living in that area, a normal human being will be a bit afraid to go in that area. But suppose if you have a machine gun, and if you know how to operate that machine gun, will you get scared? Will you ever get scared to go in an area which is controlled by gangsters? No. You have the stun gun with you, you have the machine gun, you know how to use it. Similarly, if every Muslim knows the reply, the common question asked by non-Muslims, no Muslim will ever be shy or afraid to identify himself as a Muslim. The reason we are afraid to identify as Muslims because we cannot answer the question which is posed by the non-Muslims. And for this, Alhamdulillah, I have prepared a booklet. The replies to the most common question asked by non-Muslims. And there are about 20 common questions which a non-Muslim poses about Islam to a Muslim. And the answer to these questions have been given in that booklet, which will inshallah be printed. If every Muslim masters the reply to these questions, he will never ever feel apologetic to face the non-Muslim. He'll be proud. Alhamdulillah, if I have to go out not wearing a cap, it is like a fish out of water. Without the label, it's like a fish out of water. Alhamdulillah, this cap, it does wonders. It helps me to do my job. It helps me to remain on the Sarat al-Mustaqeen, on the Haq. Because I identify myself as Muslim, and I agree that I am a person who follows the religion of Haq, Dinul Haq. 
every religion has a certain label. The Christians, their label is the cross. The Hindus, their label is the Om, or maybe a vermilion, a tikka, which they wear on the head. The Jews, they wear a small cap behind. We can easily identify this is not a Muslim cap, it's a Jewish cap, a small cap. Every religion has a certain label. But the community, we should be appreciated, which should be maximum appreciated for wearing the label is the Sikh community. The Sikhs, they are hardly 2% in the population of India, which is close to a billion people. Less than 2% are Sikhs. But they are proud to identify themselves as Sikhs. Always they wear the label. You know, they wear that turban, which is a particular type of turban, the way they tie it. And they also have a beard. They are proud to identify themselves as Sikhs. And if any person wants to indicate that this human being is an Indian coming from India, he will always focus on a Sikh. For example, if you see in a cricket match or any match which is going abroad, and if they want to identify that Indians are there in the audience, they will focus on a Sikh. Though he's less than 2%, he's not an Indian, which is a sample Indian. Less than 2%, a minority of a minority. Yet, when the people want to identify that he's an Indian, they focus on a Sikh, because he's proud to wear his label. Irrespective whether he enrolls himself in the army, or the navy, or the air force, he does not give up his label. And I was shocked that when I'd been to Canada, I read a report that a Sikh who migrated to Canada and was a citizen of Canada, the Canadian government, they objected that he cannot wear the turban in the army. He fought a case in the court and he won the case. That even in Canada, he was allowed to maintain his label. Imagine, in Canada, he wants to identify himself that he's a Sikh, and he won the case. We know many of the Muslims who, when they go for a job, and if the boss says, you know, the beard is a bit shabby, I'll give you a job if you remove the beard, and many of us, next day will shave the beard. It's a shame on us. It's a shame on us. The Sikhs are a minority of a minority. In the world population, it's insignificant, yet they want to identify themselves as Sikhs. I'm not talking about all the Muslims, I'm talking about few Muslims who are afraid to wear the label. It's a shame. And our beloved Prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Volume number two, in the book of Salah. Hadith number 1932 as well as 1933 and 1934, in three hadith, the beloved Prophet said, that when you go for the Eid in Salah, for Salah of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, the Ramzan Eid and the Bakr Eid, which as we know here, when you go for the Salah of this to Eid take along with you the young woman, as well as the menstruating woman, as well as the Parda observing woman, even though the menstruating women, they do not offer salah, they only supplicate, take them along. A prophet said, when you go for the Eden salah, take along with you the children, the young women, the parda observing women, even the menstruating women, even if they cannot pray. What was the logic of the beloved prophet to command the Muslim ummah to go along with the young women, the parda observing women, as well as the menstruating women, even if they cannot offer salah? What was the logic? The logic is that, as we know, for the Eid Salah, all the people gather under one place, especially in the villages. If two, three villages are close by, they gather in an Eid Gah, a place where they offer Eid Salah together. In the city in Bombay, it's a bit different, you know, because it's a city, it's a vast city, it's difficult, we can't go outside Bombay. It's too far. So we have the Eid Salah in various mosques, but yet we try and see to it that the congregation is big. But normally, 
in the other places, in the villages, etc. You gather together in the open ground in Eidgah. For example, if there are three small villages, if they have a common Eidgah, so the Muslim, when he comes for the Eid Salah, he sees 30,000 Muslims in these three small villages, 30,000 Muslims, the morale of the Muslims is boosted. He feels proud. 30,000 Muslims all gathered together, you know. You can make out that the Muslims, the morale is boosted. And if a non-Muslim, when he sees 30,000 Muslims in these three small villages, he will think 10 times before creating mischief with the Muslims. If he has to create any trouble for the Muslims, he will think a hundred times. And simultaneously, the morale of the Muslim is boosted. That's why beloved Prophet said, when you go for Eid Salah, gather in congregation along with the children, young women, parda observing women, as well as the menstruating women, even if they cannot offer Salah. For example, if you're traveling in a bus, traveling in a BST bus, and suppose there is a Muslim sister of us who's traveling in a bus. And if in that bus, along with the Muslim sister, sitting somewhere else, there are about five to 10 Muslims sitting in the bus wearing the label, wearing a cap and sporting a beard. These 10 people don't know each other. Neither do they know that Muslim girl. But if a non-Muslim wants to create mischief with the Muslim girl, if he wants to create trouble for the Muslim girl, for the Muslim, huh? the non-Muslim will think 10 times. Oh, there are 10 people in the bus, you know, a Muslim wearing a cap and sporting a beard. He will think 10 times before creating mischief. Even if those 10 people are old people, they can't even raise a finger. Even if they can't hurt anyone yet, only seeing them, he will think 10 times. Oh, 10 people who are Muslims. If I create mischief, these 10 people will pounce on me. It does wonders. Wearing the label does wonders. It does not only benefit you, it even benefits your other Muslim brothers and sisters. Once, there was an elderly gentleman who was a good Muslim, alhamdulillah, prayed five times a day, had gone for hajj, he was a haji. He always fasted in the month of Ramadan, he gave the zakat, he was a pious Muslim, but he did not have any label. Didn't wear the cap, did not sport a beard. One day when he goes on the streets to buy some fruits from the hawker, and he asks the name of the hawker, that young boy, that beta, son, what's your name? So he says, uncle, my name is Ahmad. So the elderly Muslim, he says, beta, son, why didn't you wish me salam? So the young Ahmad says, uncle, I thought you were a Hindu. Imagine the young boy, he calls the elderly pious gentleman a mushrik. The biggest abuse you can give to any Muslim is to call him a mushrik. There is no bigger abuse for a Muslim than to call him a mushrik. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, as well as in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgiveth the sin of associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any other sin, if Allah pleases, he may forgive. But associating partners with Allah, shirk, he will never forgive. For committing shirk is the most heinous sin. I'm asking a question. Who is to blame? Who is to blame because he called that elderly gentleman a mushrik? And the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72. لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسْيُّ بْنُ مَرِمَا That they said, the Christians, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The verse continues, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ But said Christ, 
Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who's my Lord and your Lord. Innahumma shrik billah. And anyone who associates partners with Allah, Fakad haram Allah alayhi jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him. Fama wahun nar, fama li zalimin min ansar, and fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. The glorious Quran says that innahumma shrik billah. Anyone who associates partners with Allah, Fakad haram Allah alayhi jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him. Anyone who does shirk, he will go to hell. If he dies as a mushrik, he'll go to hell. I am asking a question, who is to blame if a young Muslim boy calls the elderly gentleman a mushrik, who's to blame? You can't blame that young boy. He's innocent. It is the elderly gentleman who's to blame. That why doesn't he wear the label? If the label shows your intent, you should wear it. What is the label for the Muslim, for the Muslim woman? Even they have a label. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, that say to the believing woman that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty and display not the beauty except what appears ordinarily of and draw their veil over the bosom and display not the beauty except to their husbands, their fathers, their sons and a big list of mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. And the criteria for hijab is mentioned in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. There are basically six criteria. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. Some scholars say even the feet below the ankle can be seen. There are some scholars who say that even the face and the hands should be covered. This is extinct. The remaining five criteria is the same for the man and the woman. The second is that the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. We have many of our Muslim brothers who wear jeans. There are also stretch jeans, you know, skin tight stretch jeans. Wearing skin tight stretch jeans, aura of the man is from the navel to the knee. He cannot wear any clothes which reveal the figure of that part. You know, skin tight where you can see the curves. It's not allowed. The third, the clothes they wear, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. The Muslim woman may be covering the body, they may be wearing loose clothes, but it may be transparent, you know, made of Georgia or something like that. That's not allowed. Fourth is, it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth is, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. Any label which is a specific sign of an unbeliever, a Muslim cannot wear. For example, a Muslim cannot wear a cross. It's a specific sign of Christianity. He cannot wear Om, which is a sign of Hinduism. He cannot wear a Varmilon or a Tika, which is a sign of Hindu. He cannot wear any specific signs which is a sign of an unbeliever. And the sixth criteria is, you cannot wear clothes that which resemble the opposite sex. If you go to the Western countries, you have many boys and gents, they wear a earring, only one earring. It has certain significance. If you wear one earring, it has certain significance. And the Indians, whatever America does, after a few years when we follow. And you find even in Bombay nowadays, men wearing one earring. According to Islamic Sharia, you cannot wear clothes that which resemble that of the opposite sex. And the reason for hijab for the woman is given in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 59, where it says that, O Prophet, tell your wives and the believing woman that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. The Quran says that hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. 
For example, if two sisters who are twins, and if both of them are very beautiful, they're equally beautiful, if they're walking down the streets of Bombay, and if one of the twin sister, he's wearing the Islamic hijab, the complete body covered, except the face and the handle up to the wrist, and the other twin sister, she's wearing the Western clothes, the skirt or the mini. And if they're walking down the streets, and if round the corner there is a hooligan, there is a ruffian who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl. I'm asking a question, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab, or will he tease the girl wearing the skirt or the mini? Which girl will he tease? But naturally, he will tease the girl wearing the skirt or the mini. The Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed for the woman so that it shall prevent them from being molested. There are some of our Muslim sisters who may give the excuse that when we wear the hijab, when we wear the scarf, or when we wear the coat or the hijab, the people, they stare at us. Therefore, it is unnecessary attracting attention. I tell them, I do agree with you, there may be cases in which, because you are unique, no one around you is wearing the hijab, and if you wear the hijab, people may look at you because you are odd, the odd man out, or rather the odd woman out. It may, it may happen. But I tell them that when the people look at you when you wear the hijab, they don't look at you with lust, they look at you with respect. There's a difference. To the other lady who's wearing the skirt or the mini, the men look at with lust. To you, if they look at you, they look at you with respect. They may look at you because you may look unique. But when they look at you, they look at you with respect. And you can ask this question to the lady who do hijab. And even my sister, alhamdulillah, she confirms that because we wear the hijab, alhamdulillah, the people around us respect us. When we go in the bus, they offer us a seat. Alhamdulillah. It elevates the position of the woman. And many women think that if you have to wear a hijab, you have to wear a black burqa. It is compulsory. Nowhere does the Islamic Sharia say that you should wear only a black burqa. As long as it doesn't attract the opposite sex, you can wear any color. You can wear brown, you can wear blue, you can wear white, you can wear ivory, you can wear any color. Maybe people prefer black, you know, because if you wear a black burqa, you may have to wash it once in a week or once in a fortnight. If you wear a white burqa, you may have to wash it every day or maybe every alternate day. So the choice is yours. You can either wear a black burqa and wash it once a week or wear a white burqa or light color burqa and wash it every couple of days. The option is yours. Nowhere does the Islamic Sharia say that you should wear black. If you want, you can wear black, you can wear any color, as long as you follow the six criteria of the Islamic Sharia. We have many Muslims, especially living in India, who have various types of surnames and names. And there are various surnames which match with the surnames of the non-Muslims. And especially, the Muslims of the Kokan region, the Kokanis, and even I'm a Kokni, so that no Kokni feels offended. And if you analyze the surname of certain Muslims, depending on the region they're coming from, their surname resembles that of the non-Muslims, of the Hindus. So you have a Thakur, a Muslim Thakur, and a Hindu Thakur. You have the Patel, the Muslim Patel, and a Hindu Patel. You have the Naik, Naik, my surname is Naik. You have the Muslim Naik and the Hindu Naik. You have Pawaskar, a Muslim Pawaskar and a Hindu Pawaskar. You have Muslims coming from the Gujarat side who have surnames like Shah. You have a Muslim Shah, you have a Hindu Shah. Surname like Desai. You have a Muslim Desai and a Hindu Desai. We cannot identify from the surname whether the person is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. If you read the tradition of beloved prophet, the Prophet never ever changed the family name. He never advised the people to change the family name. You know why? The family name shows the roots. And identification of the roots is very important in Islam. 
Therefore, the Prophet never ever recommended any Muslim to change his family name, whatever his name was. Because if you know, ah, Naik, Kokni, coming from Kokan region, you come to know the roots. Ah, Thakur, if you're a Muslim coming from the Kokan region. Ah, Shah, coming from the Gujarat side. You come to know the lineage, the area where you come from. But many a times, along with the surname, which may get mixed up with the non-Muslim, you even have names which can get mixed up with the non-Muslims. You have Muslim, huh? Muslim women who have the name Kishwar. You have a Muslim Kishwar and a non-Muslim Kishwar. You have names such as Sheila. You know, there are some Muslim women who have the name Sheila. Even the Hindu has Sheila. You have Danish, Muslim Danish and a Parsi Danish. There are certain names which are common. And some of the Muslims, when they have a non-Muslim type of surname, like Thakur, Patel, or Naik, they take advantage of the situation. And they try and manipulate. If they're meeting a uh, Muslim, certain names of Muslims are identical. You can easily identify the Muslim, like Abdullah, Sultan, Muhammad, Zakir. No two doubts that Abdullah, Zakir, Muhammad, Sultan, they are Muslims. No two doubts. So if you have a label which clearly identifies and a name is specific, there's no two doubts that you are a Muslim. But certain Muslims take advantage if they have a surname which matches with a non-Muslim. If they meet a Muslim, they say the full name. Like Muhammad Naik, full name. That's the name of my brother. And if they meet a non-Muslim, they say M Naik. It can be Manohar Naik. It can be Manoj Naik. My brother doesn't do that. But I'm telling the example so that no one feels hurt. No one says that I'm particularly pinpointing because it's very common. They write M Naik, only M Naik. Or M A Naik, M D Naik, whatever it is. You can't identify whether the Muslim or non-Muslim. When they meet Muslims, they say the full name. So using such things, intentionally trying to manipulate that if a Muslim comes, maybe like a good customers, I want to identify I'm a Muslim. If a non-Muslim comes, I try and deceive him. It is nothing but deception which Islam is completely against. If your name happens to resemble a non-Muslim, if your surname, no problem keep it, but don't use the strategy of trying to win over people by deceiving them. Islam doesn't permit that. Be proud of your name, alhamdulillah, and identify yourself to be as Muslims. You know, when you go to school, you have a particular uniform. That if you're going to St. Peter's school, the school which I went to, you have gray trousers and white shirt. You can immediately identify he's a St. Peter ride, a student of St. Peter's school. If he's going to St. Mary's school, he wears white trousers and white shirt. And if I, that he is a student of St. Mary's school. And they have a particular different color ties, etc. It's easy to identify. They wear a uniform known as the school uniform. It identifies the person. In the organization which I come from, Islamic Research Foundation, even we have a label in our foundation. You know, some people wear their blazers, blue blazers, or a particular trousers, navy blue trousers, and light blue shirt. In the Islamic Research Foundation, our label is cap and a beard. Any person wants to join IRF, the first criteria in the interview we tell him is that if you join this, it's compulsory you should wear a cap and sport a beard. No two option. Whether the beard suits you or not, it's compulsory. If you keep it for the love of Allah and his Rasul, inshallah you'll get sawab. You should do it for that. But irrespective whether you like it or not, if you want to join IRF, Islamic Research Foundation, as an employee, it's compulsory wearing a cap and sporting a beard. Alhamdulillah, that's our label. We prefer the label of Islam for the people working in IRF. It's compulsory. You know the doctors? When a person becomes a doctor, from the name Mr. So-and-so, it changes to Dr. So-and-so. You know why? Because being a doctor, Alhamdulillah, it's a noble profession. It elevates you. Other people are good people, but I'm a doctor. I'm of a noble profession. From mister, it changes to doctor. 
And if a doctor has a car, he puts a cross on his car, on his vehicle, to identify the doctor. That if a person, if you're going on the streets, and if he requires any help, if a person has an accident, they can easily stop a doctor's car. Ah, this person is of a medical profession. If the label shows your intent, you wear it. Similarly, we Muslims, alhamdulillah, if the label shows your intent, you should wear it. You should be proud to identify yourself as Muslims, so that if any person requires any spiritual help, any help where Iman is concerned, where faith is concerned, he can approach a person wearing a cap and sporting a beard. It's easy. It identifies you. There are various benefits of wearing the label. Various benefits. Besides you getting sawab, because they're following Allah and His Rasul, you'll get sawab for that. There are various benefits. If suppose you go to an area which is new to you, and if the time for salah is there, and you want to go to the mosque, who will you ask where is the mosque? We look for a person wearing a cap and a beard. Okay, he's a Muslim, he will be able to guide me. Even if it's a small mosque, he may know that, okay, it's there in a small gully. Or if it's a big mosque, he will tell it's there. And if a person travels a lot, you know, I'm a person who travels a lot. And when we go to the Western country, we have a big problem with Muslims for halal food, for having zabiya food. Now, where are we going to ask a person, where do we get halal food? If we ask a non-Muslim, where is halal food? He will not understand what is halal food. There's a problem. So we look at the person, ah, one person amongst hundreds of them wearing a cap and a beard. Brother, bhai sahab, salam alaikum, alaikum salam, wish them and ask them, where can get halal food? It's difficult. It's very far. Why don't you come to a house? I will give you. Alhamdulillah. You don't have to pay also for that. Not that you have to wear the label so that you save your money for the food. But it does wonders. It has happened several times with me. When you go to an area where there's no halal food and you ask the Muslim brother offers, why don't you come to my house? Or he says, okay, there's a restaurant which is just take a left turn and a right and second lane again in the left and you find a restaurant there. Alhamdulillah. It does wonders. And it opens the opportunity for doing da'wah. If you wear the label, it allows you to do a compulsory duty of the Muslim that is propagate the message of Islam. It does wonders. And there are various types of labels. For example, if you go to the house of a Muslim, you know, if the Muslim wants to identify himself as a Muslim, he may have certain posters or certain big lettering, ayats, Arabic writing, maybe like, Haza min fazli rabbi. All is due to the bounty of the beloved Lord. It may say, Rabbi zidni ilman, oh my Lord, increase me knowledge. You can easily identify that this house belongs to a Muslim. Maybe mention Allah Akbar, easy. And now, technology is advancing, and new labels are coming up with the help of technology. You have a clock giving out the azan, the azan clock. When you ring the bell, it says, Assalamu alaikum. New, new labels are being invented. Alhamdulillah, it may help you. And if you go to an office, in the office you may have certain inscription or certain posters that indicate that this office belongs to a Muslim. If you enter the auditorium of Islam Foundation, the first ayat in front of the is, Inna dina in the Allah al-Islam. The only religion, the only deen acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Directly, no problem. Indicates that this premises belongs to a Muslim. When you travel in a vehicle, in a car, you may have certain stickers mentioning Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. And nowadays, you know, I have a habit when I go out and travel abroad, for my friends, I get certain tokens, like keychains, Islamic keychains. And one, when I've gone to Jeddah, a new device is fitted. It's a device which you put in the car. The moment you switch on the car, the moment you give the ignition, it starts. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah rahman rahim Subhanallazi sakhra lana haza wa ma lahu mukrini. It starts the dua. When you start the journey, which our Prophet recommended, that praise be to Allah and seek Allah's guidance, that he may have control over the vehicle, etc. And if the passenger is sitting next to you, if he doesn't know the dua, he memorizes it. Alhamdulillah. It does wonders. 
There are various labels available. And when I came the first time to Millat Nagar, it was after the riots, about in the year 1993, about more than five years back. The first time when I came to Millat Nagar, and when I entered, and when I read the name on the buildings, Al Makkah, Al Madina, Muzdalifa, Arafat, Mina, believe me, touched my heart. Alhamdulillah. I was so impressed that this full colony had known that it's one of the biggest colony of Muslims. But when I entered Makkah, Medina, Muzdalifa, Mina, Alhamdulillah, it impressed me a lot. Every building, the moment you read the name, anyone can realize that this is a Muslim building. And when the people staying in Millat Nagar, when they go out and say that, if a person asks you, where do you stay? And if you say, I stay in Millat Nagar, it's taken for granted you are a Muslim. Even where you're staying, identifies what religion you belong to, alhamdulillah. But unfortunately, when I came next time, I realized that the buildings had the labels, but everyone living in the building didn't have the label. So when they go out, and when they look at them, people may not realize whether they're Muslim or not. I'm not saying that all the people of Millat Nagar, Many I've seen, alhamdulillah, who wear the label. So inshallah, when I come next time to Millat Nagar, inshallah, I would be happy that besides the buildings having the Islamic name, even the label is there on each and every individual. Inshallah, I hope that will be the case. That next time when I come to Millat Nagar, all of them, inshallah, besides having the label on the building, in the place where they're staying, they should even have the label on themselves. That when they travel out, people recognize that he's a Muslim. She's a Muslim man. She's a Muslim woman. A Muslim should never ever be afraid to identify himself as a Muslim. The only reason that a Muslim may not like to identify himself as a Muslim is if he doesn't agree that Islam is the best way of life. He may be a namesake Muslim, maybe born in a Muslim family, given a Muslim name. Otherwise, a Muslim will never feel afraid to wear his label. He may feel afraid if he doesn't know the answers. Because if you wear the label, you're proclaiming that I am a person following the religion of Haq, the religion of truth. And whenever there's a competition between truth and falsehood, truth always prevails. Truth always wins. People sometimes are afraid that if people come to know I'm a Muslim, I may lose my customers. I have non-Muslim customers. I may lose them. He's afraid. But if he knows Islam, if he identify himself as a Muslim, that he's a person following truth, he will inshallah benefit even in his business. Because the Quran clearly states, and I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ الزَّهُوكَ When truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. وَأَخْرُ دَعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ We now move on to the second part of the program, the question and answer session. We have certain suggested guidelines for conducting this question and answer session to analyze the topic. If the label shows your intent, wear it adequately for all those who are present here today. In the limited time available, we would like to follow these guidelines during this session. Questions posed should be on the topic. If the label shows your intent, wear it. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any gen general questions on religion, will not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question may be asked at a time. For your second question, move down behind the line, behind the queue you'll be standing for. We have two mics here in the gen section and one mic in the ladies section. Brothers who are uh, maybe shy of asking questions or coming forward, we would prefer if you can come forward and ask your questions on the mic. But in case uh, you, you would like, you have the alternative to 
ask your questions or write down your questions on the slip and pass it down to the volunteers who are waiting in the aisles to give you the slip. May we have our first question, please? My name is Dr. Abu Bakr Tahir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is that I was told during the 1993 riots, those people who were wearing the labels were identified and hunted down and killed the, in Bombay. In such situation, I think we should avoid wearing the label in the face of danger to our life. Thank you. Assalam. So let us ask the question that during the riots which took place in Bombay in 1992 and 1993, many people were afraid of their lives and many people removed the label. So is it right to remove the label during such things? Every rule has an exception. And the Quran clearly mentions that if under compulsion, if under compulsion, unwillingly, you can even do shirk. For example, if someone puts a gun on your temple, on your head, and asks you, are you a Muslim or a mushrik? Deep within your hearts, you know that I'm a Muslim. But to save your life under compulsion as a last resort, the Quran gives you an option that you can tell a lie in this situation. If life and death is the question, only in this situation. Similarly, if during rights you are living in a non-Muslim area, and suppose if you step out and your life will be in danger, in such situation, if you remove your label, inshallah, Allah will forgive you. For example, if in a right round the corner, a non-Muslim puts a gun on your temple, Muslim or non-Muslim, you have option of saying, you are a Muslim and become shaykh, or say, I'm a non-Muslim and get saved. Both is allowed. If round the corner, no one is watching me, what is the use? I have option of either say I'm Muslim, become shaykh, or say I'm a non-Muslim, Quran gives permission. So here if a person says I'm a non-Muslim and saves his life so that he can spread Islam afterwards, Alhamdulillah. Similarly, if someone asks me on a stage where there are hundreds and thousands of people watching me, are you a Muslim or non-Muslim? Here also I have the option both of either say I'm Muslim or non-Muslim. But here, the hikmah may say that if I give shahada, there are hundreds and thousands of people watching me, it may boost up the morale, I may prefer saying I'm a Muslim and become shaheed, alhamdulillah. So Quran gives both the permission and the compulsion. Like the Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173, Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3, in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 145, and in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse 115, that if unwillingly, if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is Rahman or Rahim. That after saying that pork is forbidden for you, if unwillingly, if you're dying of hunger, if pork is the only thing you can find, if you have gone in a boat and you have no food and someone offers you pork, for your survival, you can eat that much which is sufficient for you to survive, not eat your tummy full. But the moment you come on the shore, again it becomes prohibited. So to save your life, Islam gives permission, under compulsion, unwillingly to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is Rahman or Rahim. Here you have an option that if you feel your life is in danger or you cannot bear the mental torture, no problem. But Alhamdulillah, I do know that there are few people who remove the label and many of them, the moment that atmosphere became cordial, they wore the label again. But I know of hundreds of Muslims who did not wear the label before the riots. But after observing the rights, the morale was boosted. And they started wearing the label. I personally know of hundreds of Muslims, alhamdulillah, who after the rights wore the label. Seeing that, okay, this was the situation. We were in a problem. We should identify ourselves as Muslims. The moment the mental shock of the rights was over, alhamdulillah, many Muslims wore the label after the rights. Hope that answers the question. Maybe have the next question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Adam Nayyar. I have the very common question which we have in our mind that is it permissible for a Muslim to greet Assalamu alaikum to a non Muslim? And in case, suppose if he greet us with Assalamu alaikum, can we say him wa alaikum assalam? Can I clarify? The brother asked a common question that can a Muslim greet a non Muslim with Assalamu alaikum? Or if a non Muslim greets Assalamu alaikum, can you wish back wa alaikum assalam? And I'm aware that there are many scholars who do say that when a Muslim wishes you assalamu alaikum, you have to say alaikum. And this answer 
is based on several hadith which are given in Sahih Muslim. And if you read Sahih Muslim, volume number three, in the book of Salam, chapter number 904, hadith number 5380 to 5390, there are 11 hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim regarding this topic. But if you analyze the hadith, the first few hadith say that when the Jews wished Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum in Arabic means may death be on you. When the Jews wish you Assalamu alaikum, may death be on you, the Prophet said, wish them back alaikum. May it be on you too. So the reference to context is that when the non Muslims knowingly wish evil for you, Assalamu alaikum, sounding similar to Assalamu alaikum. When they wish, may death be on you, you have to wish back saying, alaikum, on you too. But many of the scholars say that when even the non-Muslims wish assalamu alaikum, you have to wish back alaikum. Which, if you go into details, you can get the reply from the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Let's see what does the Quran say regarding greeting back. And I said in my talk, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 86, which says, وَإِذَا قُيِّتُمْ بِتَّهِيَتِمْ فَحَيُّ بِأَحَسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْنْ حَسِيبًا That when anyone greets you courteously, wish back more courteously, or a greeting which is of equal courtesy. Because Allah is careful in keeping of the accounts. Where greeting back is concerned, we can greet them back. So regarding the question, if someone wishes you assalamu alaikum, what should you reply? Based on this Quranic verse, you can wish back more courteously or at least the same. That's what the Quran says. Regarding, can you wish them first? There are hadith of beloved prophet in the same Sahih Muslim which says that when you meet a Hali Kitab or you are a Christian, don't wish them, etc. And there are various different opinions in the various groups of scholars. But when you go to the Quran, Quran and the Sahih Hadith is the best example to be followed. The Quran says in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 47, that when Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim peace be upon him, when his father, who was a mushrik, removes him from his house, he says, Assalamu alaikum. I will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Quran says that Ibrahim alayhi salam told his father, Assalamu alaikum. And I will pray to my Almighty God, to forgive you. Further, if you read in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 47, it says that Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam, Moses and Aaron, peace be upon them, they were commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when they delivered the message to Pharaoh and his people, to wish them by saying, peace be on them, those who receive guidance. And this was one of the ways the Prophet, when he dictated letters, he said to the non-Muslim kings that peace be on you, those who receive guidance. Further, if you read in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 63, it says that when those approach you who are ignorant, tell them, Qalu salama, tell them peace. So when the ignorant come to you, who give vain talks, say, Qalu salama, wish them peace. Further, if you read in Surah Qasas, Chapter 28, verse 55 says that when you are in the company of those people who give vain talks and who speak against Islam, tell them, to us is our deeds, to you is your deeds. Peace be on you. Wish them salam. Me, those who speak against Islam. The Quran says, wish them salam. So there's no problem at all in wishing a non-Muslim salam. And if you read the tafasir of the Quranic verses, if you read the tafasir of Qurtubi regarding Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 47, it says that regarding the explanation of this verse, when Ibrahim al salam tells his father that peace be on you, I will ask Allah subhanahu to forgive you. Most of the scholars, the Jamhur scholars, ulama, they say that here the peace was only a form of greeting, like saying farewell. It wasn't a form of asking protection. So they say that this was a form of greeting. While Qurtubi, in his tafsir, he says that according to Tabari, 
he said that here it actually means peace. And further, if you read the statement of Nakash, he said that it is allowed for the Muslims to wish salam to the non-Muslim. Though the majority of the scholars say that here the greeting was only a form of a greeting. It was not asking for protection. And further, if you read the statement which Kursubi says, that I agree more with the statement of Oina, who said, and for his explanation, he quotes Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8, and say, Allah forbids not you from being just to those people who fight you not against your religion, nor drive you out of your house, for Allah loves those who are just. That means you have to be just to the people who fight you not against your religion, or drive you not out of your house. And he further says that the Quran says in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 4, that verily, in the lifestyle of Ibrahim alayhi salam, you find a very good example. What Ibrahim alayhi salam did? Alhamdulillah, you find a very good example. So when he can wish peace to his father, why can't you? So based on the scholars, if you see the tafasirs, various, even of Tabri and Ibn Qasir, when he gives the translation and the commentary, of Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 86, it says that this verse which says that when anyone wishes you courteously, wish back more courteously, does not refer to the Muslim, it can refer to any creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you analyze, there are a few group of scholars who say that it is preferable that you do not wish them, only say alaykum, but there are other group of scholars who say that you can wish them, you can initiate the greeting as well as wish them back more courteously. I agree more with those group of scholars who say that you can greet non-Muslims because if you read the sayings of Ibn Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, when he was asked, can you greet Salam to a non-Muslim? He said yes. And he did that to his companions. And he said, we Muslims have come here to spread peace. If you read the sayings of Abu Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that he used to greet the non-Muslims, whether Christian, Jews, etc., with peace. So there are scholars, majority, who do say that you can wish, while many scholars who say that it's preferable to say alaikum. I agree more with those who say that you can wish salam to a non-Muslim as well as wish them back wa alaikum as-salam. Hope that answers the question. Maybe have the question from the ladies section. Hello, salam alaikum. Wa uh, It is generally felt that the tie is the symbol of the cross. Then why do you wear the label of the Christian? That's a very good question posed by the sister. And I'm happy that such questions come so that you know many misconceptions are clarified. She asked the question that Thai is a symbol of a cross, a symbol of Christian. Then why, as I, being a Muslim, wear the Thai? And I do know that many Muslims consider the Thai to be a symbol of a cross. But I'm a student of comparative religion. Nowhere in any Christian scripture is it mentioned that Thai is a sign of a cross. And if it is, the hadith clearly says that you cannot wear that which resembles that of an unbeliever. If it's a specific symbol of a non-Muslim, you cannot wear that label, it is haram. Nowhere will you find a single statement in any verse of the Bible where it says that Thai is a sign of a cross. I am aware that many Muslims they are against the Western culture, and I don't blame them. What I say, if you find something against, if you observe something which the Westerners are doing wrong, you have to object to it. But what things they do good, there's no harm in agreeing with it. What things are neutral, there's no harm, not that you have to object to that also. Many Muslims are so much against the Western culture that they object on each and everything. Thai is not at all the symbol of Christianity. And this question is posed to me in various parts of the world. And I challenge and I tell the audience that if any Muslim can prove to me any time with authentic proof that tie the sign of a cross of a Christian, I will be the first person to remove it. And I will tell all the people not to wear it. Tie is not a sign of Christianity at all. It's not a sign of a cross at all. It's a cultural dress. And researches have been done by scholars, not from hearsay, from scholars, how did it originate? Some scholars say in the cold countries, people wore a tie to tie 
their garments which were heavy, you know, in the cold countries, you know, woolen clothes, etc. It's a cultural dress. It's not a dress of the Christian. You go throughout the world, the Christian wear, he wears a tie, Alhamdulillah, I know about it. The Muslim wears it, the Hindu wears it. It is not specifically a sign of Christianity. It's a cultural dress. And a Muslim is allowed to adopt any culture as long as it doesn't go against the Islamic Sharia. If that culture goes against the Islamic Sharia, like wearing shorts, it's the culture of the Westerners. We Muslim can't adopt it because for a man, the hijab, the aura is from the navel to the knee. He can't wear shorts. It's not allowed. Traveling in a car, the car was invented by the Christian, the Westerners. Can I say the Christian invented it, therefore I can't sit in a car? I'm not traveling in an aeroplane. Can I say that? No. Whatever is against the Sharia, you should not do. Tie is not a sign of Christianity at all. This tie, people say it looks like a cross. You open and you stretch the circle, it becomes a cross. I tell them the kurta that you wear. You put it like that, it resembles more like a cross. So you can't invent your own thinking. Oh, kurta looks like a cross, therefore stop wearing kurta. Can I tell that? Can I ever tell that? See, the prophet said, anything which is a symbol of a particular religion, don't wear those symbols. Tie is not a symbol of Christianity. It's a cultural dress. It's not a fault you should wear a tie. I'm not saying that. If you don't wear, alhamdulillah, I'm with you. But when I go to the Western country, it helps deleting certain barriers. And if Islam doesn't object to that, I don't mind using it. If Islam objects to that, I should not use anything which Islam prohibits, even if it benefits me. But since this thing, alhamdulillah, is allowed in Islam, there's no problem at all if a person wears a tie. Hope that answers the question, system. We have the next question from the brother on the right side. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, I have a question. There are certain Muslims who argue that they do not wear a cap and a beard because they may sometimes indulge in un-Islamic activities like bribing, cheating, telling lies, etc., which will spoil the name of Islam if they are identified as Muslims. Are they correct? So let us pose the question that there are certain Muslims who say and argue that we don't wear the label, the cap and the beard, because there are times that we may indulge in wrong activities, un-Islamic activities like bribing, cheating, telling lies. So we don't want to spoil the name of Islam. They are concerned, alhamdulillah. They are concerned about Islam. So therefore they say we don't want to wear the label. There are two types of people. One is a pessimist and one is an optimist. The pessimist is the person who always thinks at the negative angle. And there are such people who you are quoting. We don't want to wear the label because sometimes once in a blue moon we may do wrong activity like bribing, cheating, telling lies. So we don't want to spoil the name of Islam. So I tell them that why don't you be an optimist? That if you know that sometimes you do bad things and once you start wearing the label, the cap and the beard, and suppose it happens that the opportunity arises that you have to bribe. You start thinking, oh, now I'm wearing the label. How can I bribe? And you will not bribe, alhamdulillah. If the opportunity comes where you can cheat and you realize, oh, I'm wearing a label, how can I spoil the name of Islam? You will not cheat. If you have to tell a lie to support what you're saying and you realize, oh, I'm wearing a label, cap and the beard, you will not lie. Irrespective whether it benefits you in this world or not, it will, inshallah. Inshallah, in the akhirah, it will benefit you. And I ended my talk by quoting the verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 81, that if you are a Muslim, Muslim means a person who submits will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's proud to be a Muslim. He's proud to submit will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Proud to follow a religion of haq. If he's truly a Muslim, he should also follow the haq. And if he's on the haq, the Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 81, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ زَوْكَ When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. So what I tell such people, that if you feel that once in a while if you do wrong activities, and if you wear the label to spoil the name of a label, instead of being a pessimist, you become an optimist. You wear a label, and inshallah, it will make you a better Muslim. And if you're so much concerned about the Muslim Ummah and the name of Islam, it will, besides helping the Muslim Ummah, it will even help you. It will help you, 
and see to it that you remain on Sirat al Mustaqeem. Hope that answers the question. The next question from brother on the left, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Farkan Khan, and I'm an electronic engineer. Um, by profession, I'm a businessman. In my uh, company where I'm working is uh, mostly Hindus and Jains. And uh, I have found that people looking down upon on the, on the Muslims, those who are wearing headgear and even uh, beard. So I would like to know why even I have studied Islam and comparative religion to spread Islam. If we can keep ourselves away from at least headgear and beard, we, I found it is more easy to make them explain. Brother asked the question that he is a student of comparative religion, Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward you. He says that if you keep away from these labels like headgear and beard, it helps you to spread Islam more, according to you. Everyone has the right to his opinion. Brother, fortunately, when I happen to be in this field, I am not aware how much dawah you do, but Alhamdulillah, I travel throughout the world. This headgear doesn't come in my way at all. Give me one example, if you are a dai, that the headgear comes in between your way. If you are not a dai, if you are materialistic, ah, if I'm a Muslim, if a non-Muslim comes to know I'm a Muslim, he will not come to my shop. If you are a materialistic person, temporarily you may think it's a loss. But you say you're a student of comparative religion, you live with Jains, etc. Brother, I am a dai, I'm a full-time dai, alhamdulillah. Give me one example in your experience in which the headway will come in your way. Alhamdulillah, it helps me. It helps me. Break the barriers. Yes, brother, you want to give an example? Most welcome. See, the thing is that there may be situations in which you may not know how to handle it. So Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, that if you do not possess the knowledge, ask of those who possess the knowledge. Go to an expert, and he will show you how to solve the problem. Don't take a decision which is wrong. Yes, brother, what's the problem? I'll solve it. See, actually, you are, you are a full-time guy. We are not a full-time guy. We are doing a business. Along with that, I would like to do this work. When I'm sitting in my office, I talk to my employee people also. I talk to them. I try, and Alhamdulillah, at least one or two, I could uh, make them even convinced. But the thing is that okay, what I have found, okay, even Gujaratis and even those people, when they see you, see your, even my colleague, one colleague is having a beard. They don't uh, approach him. Even they don't bring him closer. But when I go to them and I talk to them, I find that people are listening to me. So that's what I found it is more easier for me to uh, spread it. The brother has given an example that he has his colleagues, and he's not a full-time die like me. Now he's changed. First he said a comparative religion. Now he says he's not a full-time die. No one is stopping you from being a full-time die. It's the best profession. Better than a medical doctor also. I was a medical doctor. I left my profession for a better profession. Quran says in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 33, it says, Woman asunu kala mimman dua ila lahi, wa amin solihum. Kala inna ni minal muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites the people to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says, I'm the first to bow my will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best profession is the profession of dai. Regarding a question that you have got colleagues and he's not a full time dai, so the colleagues, they say that these people, they don't come close to the people who have a beard. And wear a cap. Brother, before I became a full-time guy, I was a student in a medical college. And majority of my colleagues were non-Muslims. Qatar, very strong against the Muslim. Alhamdulillah. And yet, they may be allergic to a person having a beard, wearing a cap. But Alhamdulillah, they love me. Because I use hikmah. Quran says, you know how to do dawah? In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them, and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. You have to use your hikmah when you do dawah. And if you use your hikmah, the cap and the beard can never come in your way. You can tell your non-Muslim friend that, you know, I have come to know of a Muslim, alhamdulillah, who has a beard. Tell me, you know, there's a young boy, you know, young boy by the name of Zakir. He says he can speak with non-Muslim. He's very comfortable. He wears a cap. He sports a beard. He's comfortable. You can give my cassettes. Alhamdulillah. If I don't have the time to meet them personally, you can give the cassette. It does wonders. I don't live with the non-Muslim. Alhamdulillah. But these cassettes, they have done wonders. You are talking about convincing one person. Alhamdulillah. By Allah's grace, hundreds and thousands have been convinced by the talks. Alhamdulillah. So it is only a misconception. It's your inferiority complex. That if you say Islam is the best religion, why are you afraid 
to identify yourself as Muslim. I'll give you an example. There's an elderly gentleman who's very old, who's very feeble, who's saying, I have got the water secret to strength. If you drink this water, you'll live 100 years more. You will be a strong man. And this old man, one foot is in the grave. He wants to sell his water bottle for 100 rupees. Will anyone buy? I have got a water bottle, a bottle of water costing 100 rupees. If you drink this, you will live for 100 years more. You will become the strongest man in the world. Will you believe in him? Will you believe in him? Yes or no? Why? The person, one foot is in the grave. If the water can give him strength, why does he drink it himself? So if you are spreading Islam and you are afraid to call yourself Muslims, how come you are following the best religion? You are a hypocrite. I'm sorry to say, if you are afraid to call yourself a Muslim and you say Islam is the best religion, that means you're a hypocrite. Will any logical person buy the water of an old man who's one foot in the grave and who says that this water, if you drink, you will live for 100 years, you'll be the strongest man? It's hypocrisy. Alhamdulillah, even we meet non-Muslims. And it does wonder, when I pass the customs, the non-Muslims, when they see me, Alhamdulillah, they respect me. Oh, you're the same man who comes on the cable TV. Alhamdulillah, they give me red carpet treatment. They know I'm spreading Islam. People may not know about the other Muslims who keep a beard and a cap, but they know me very well. Alhamdulillah. They respect me. I don't have to bribe. I don't have to bribe, Alhamdulillah. They respect me. Allah opens up the pathways. If you're apologetic, if you have an inferiority complex, if there's something wrong in your heart, and then you start thinking, ah, you know, the, that means you're agreeing with the non-Muslim that those who keep a beard, they are wrong. What do you have to do? You start growing a beard and tell your non-Muslim friend, see, previously, you used to respect me because I didn't have a beard. You didn't like the people who had a beard. From today, I'm going to start growing a beard, inshallah, inshallah. And then you tell them that, see, brother, I'm the same. I'm the same man. I'm the same man who has a beard and wear a cap. Now, has my nature changed? And you don't change your nature. Improve, alhamdulillah. And you give them an example. See, brother, you know you have a misconception that the beard and the cap, the people wearing a beard and a cap, they are wrong people. They are gundas, they are notorious. See, I've lived with you for so many years. In this few weeks, inshallah, from now when you sport a beard, you will tell your non-Muslim friend, I have a beard, I'm wearing a cap. Has my nature changed? Alhamdulillah. It will open up your pathways and you'll be able to do more dawa. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the ladies section, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I would like to know whether you have to recite Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilahi Rajoon on hearing the news of a death of a Hindu. The sister has posed the question that is it allowed that can we recite Inna Ilahi Inna Ilahi Rajoon when you hear the news of death of a person? And people normally think that only when you hear the news of death do you have to recite this. It's the verse of the Quran. It doesn't say that only when you hear the news of death you have to recite. Anything which you feel, which you feel is not right. For example, if someone falls down also, you can say, in Naila in Razun. That doesn't mean that I'm thinking that he's dead. You know, some people think when you recite this, oh, he has only fallen down, he hasn't died. So many Muslims think that you can only recite this when a person dies. It's a misconception. Any mishap that happens, any misgiving, you can say, in Naila in Razun. Regarding the question, can you say that to a person when you hear the news of a non-Muslim dying? What is the meaning of that? The meaning of this recitation of the Quran is from him we come and to him we return. Even the non-Muslim has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has not been evolved from somewhere else. Allah is his creator. Allah is his Rabb. Allah is his Khalik. Alhamdulillah. And he will go back to Allah only, even if he's a mushrik. So there's no harm in reciting this. Yes, you may not go there and pray for him. Because if a person dies as a mushrik, you cannot pray for him. There's a verse in the Quran. If a person dies as a mushrik, after he dies, you cannot say, Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give him jannat e firdos. How can you say that? Allah says clearly in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 116, that if a person dies as a mushrik, if a person is a mushrik, Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. If before dying, if the mushrik repents, Allah will forgive him. But if a person dies as a mushrik, he shall never go to Jannah. So you cannot pray for him for Jannah. You can very well say that from Allah he has come and to Allah he has returned. There's no problem at all. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. 
my name is suleiman lokhandwala from samarth nagar my question is why in most of the gulf and arab countries no other than arabs are allowed to wear abas gown which prophet muhammad be peace be upon him used to wear the brother posed the question that why are only arabs those living in the gulf countries are allowed to wear the abaya the gown which prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore brother i don't know where you got this information from that only arabs can wear this anyone can wear if it's comfortable even people presented me with these and a couple of times i wore it you know but i'm not used to it so what you are used to it no problem i know many muslim living in bombay who wear that garb very well you can wear the full gown you can even wear the peta the thing that they cover that no problem at all if you are comfortable with it you can wear it so it's a misconception that you have that only person living in the gulf country can wear dear brother you have some question alhamdulillah i had been to hajj and in madina sharif i had heard and uh, they say even if you wear that that even police may uh, come and uh, get you into the uh, court the brother has been to madina alhamdulillah i congratulate you i have been to makkah madina several times alhamdulillah several times i don't know many times i keep on traveling inshallah i'll be going back after a couple of weeks also the brother said if you wear that police will catch you whether it's a misinformation what you are trying to say i will correct you that the saudi is normally and certain countries they wear the black ring which is a symbol of a saudi not that white gown there are many indians and there are many indians from here who may have been to gulf countries and when indians go to gulf countries they wear that gown they even wear that cloth no problem but particularly that black ring which you say circles that particularly people say that it is a symbol that you are a citizen of saudi it's not a symbol that you are a muslim it's a symbol that you are a citizen of saudi so if that is a symbol of a citizen of a saudi and if you are not a saudi and if the object is no problem but wearing that dress no one will object i have been several times i have worn it if you want next time when you go you can buy it and you can wear it and i'll challenge you no one will catch you it's a misinformation you have got therefore the quran says if you hear any information check it up before spreading it hope that answers the question excuse me brother we'll have the next question from the brother on the left side left mic my name is pros and i am a student of engineering my question is it is observed that many girls while leaving from home wear burqa and at the college gate they remove it and inside they wear jeans and t-shirts etc about their behavior and relations with boys they are termed as miss character some people give the opinion that the girls wearing burqa are miss character due to this the girls actually falling are get hurted there are also few girls including non muslims who wear burqa to hide the identity when they are on the move with their boyfriend what you advise about this brother pose the question that there are some muslim or muslim women who wear the burqa but when they go to the college they remove the burqa inside they wear jeans etc and they misbehave with the men etc the hijab of a muslim woman should only be done in front of the nahmaram if they are going to a ladies college in which everyone there is a woman so if they wear the burqa on the streets and in the classroom where there are only ladies they remove the burqa there's no problem at all no problem at all but i do know you are referring to certain colleges which have got men and women coed colleges have got college which contain male and female students in this case it is wrong in front of the nahmaram it's compulsory they should wear burqas if there are a few muslim women who do this that doesn't mean that no muslim women should wear a burqa it is that there are black sheep in every community there are black sheep in every community just by picking up this black sheep and saying that because these few people are doing wrong activities therefore i will not do that that's not right at all for example if you have to judge a car a mercedes car which has bought in the market latest model and you ask a person to sit behind the steering wheel who does not know how to drive the car he doesn't know how to drive and he bangs up the car who will you blame the car or the driver who will you blame the driver the person driving the car doesn't know how to drive if you want to check how good the car is 
you have to see how good is the specification, how powerful it is, what are securities, what is the average, how fast can it go, etc., etc. And if you want to judge how good the car is practically, let a person who knows how to drive the car sit behind the steering wheel. Therefore, by saying that I will not wear a burqa because some women, they misbehave with men and take advantage, is like you saying that Mercedes car is bad because the driver doesn't know how to drive. Illogical. There are black sheep in every community. Hitler, you know Hitler, he incinerated six million Jews. Six million Jews. Can I blame Christianity for that? Can I? No. He's a bad example. So similarly, if certain women do these activities, all the more reason the other Muslims should say, because there are certain Muslim women who are maligned in the name of Islam, all the more reason I should wear burqa and prove to the other human beings that a Muslim woman is good. If you find certain Muslim women who are misbehaving because of certain ill information, certain bad nature in this, we as Muslims should do islah, should improve them. At the same time, all the more reason you should wear the label more. If suppose a Mercedes car comes to no company, that a person doesn't know how to drive and banged up the car, they'll give a full page ad. No, the person who drove the car didn't know how to drive. Therefore, he banged up the car. So therefore, you have to advertise more. All the more reason you should wear. And prove to the people that Islam is the best way of life. So you cannot say that I will not wear burqa based on the wrong did by certain Muslimah. Regarding the second part of the question, that there are certain non-Muslims, non-Muslims, who wear the burqa to hide themselves. So I've got no objection. Alhamdulillah. Now they're wearing it to hide, hide from certain reason. Maybe tomorrow they'll accept, inshallah. I'm aware that there are certain non-Muslims who wear it to do wrong activities. Who wear it to do wrong activities. So maybe Allah will open up the heart one day. We cannot tell them that, see, what you're doing is wrong. We can tell them that the niya is wrong. You cannot say wearing burqa is wrong. You can tell them your niya, the reason that burqa is there is to protect the modesty. You are taking advantage of this act and doing an immodest act. We have to correct them. And we have to let the people know that burqa is actually for the modesty and give the reply for the hijab, which you can refer to my video cassette, that why Muslims should wear hijab. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the lady is sister section, please. Brother, uh, can I ask you some question which is particularly relation to the question put forward by Mr. Firoz. When boy, Muslim boys studying in colleges always are attracted by non-Muslim girls who wear these dresses and they have an affair with them and they marry them at any cost. What about the Muslim girls? The sister posed the question that many Muslim boys they are attracted by the non-Muslim girls you know, because they don't wear the hijab, etc. So that's the reason that the Muslim women aren't getting married. What about the Muslim girl? Sister, my advice to you is, as a brother of yours, that it is good, alhamdulillah, these type of boys aren't marrying you. And even if they offer to marry you, you should not marry them. Thank you for the advice. Because our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when you look for a life partner, there are four things in which a person looks for. Beauty, wealth, nobility and virtue and the best among them is virtue is virtue if you know that the muslim boy who is a namesake muslim a good muslim boy will never will never look at a woman even if she's not in hijab these muslim may be namesake muslim as the quran says there are lip service muslims lip service muslim who say they are muslim but they aren't muslim in the heart so you as a muslim as a good muslim woman who does the hijab even if these boys offer to marry you you should say my beloved prophet said, I should marry those men who are virtuous. You are not a virtuous man. You should not marry them. Inshallah, Allah will give you a better match. And regarding that who will marry the Muslim woman, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has the provision, alhamdulillah. It is preferable. It's preferable to marry a bit late. Though the prophet said, marry as early as possible. In Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, chapter number three, hadith number four. The Prophet said, oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married should get married. This situation will never prevent you from getting married. It will only prevent you from getting involved in a person who's wrong. 
So my advice, sister, is that don't go after such men and don't even desire to marry such men. Inshallah, Allah will give you a better match. Assalamu alaikum. This is Muhammad Sarwar Farooqi. My question is to Dr. Naik. Why you always deliver your lecture in English on Islam? Why not in, in, in Urdu or in, in, a, in our national language, which can be better understood by everybody? So that was a very good question, that why do I always give the lecture in English? Why not in Urdu or the language understood, since Urdu is a national language? Brother asked for a good question. The reason, brother, that I give in English is because I've got more command over English as compared to Urdu. I can't speak Urdu. I can't speak Hindi. But I don't have a command. As good command as I have over English. You know, the psychology, they tell us that the language in which you dream is your mother tongue. The language in which you dream is my mother tongue. My mother has a tongue. But if you ask me, according to psychologists, which is my mother tongue? The best language which I can speak, I can write, I can think is in English. So that way, English is my mother tongue. Not that I'm a Angriski Aulad. But it is the language you can dream in, the language you're most comfortable, becomes your mother tongue. The reason I give in English is because my study on comparative religion is based in English. Now, if for example, if I read ayat of the Quran, I know several ayat, alhamdulillah, by heart, and I know English better, I've memorized the translation, I translate. Now, if I give in Urdu, from Arabic to English, from English to Urdu, there may be mistakes. And if I do a freehand translation, I may misquote the Hadith, I may misquote the Quran. Therefore, I prefer sticking to English. Not that speaking in Urdu is wrong. It's good, Alhamdulillah. And besides that, there are hundreds and thousands of people in India who speak in Urdu. How many speakers do you know in India who speak in English? How many do you know? How many? That, uh, sir, the question is that uh, those who understand English, they have some tests. Those who do not, then there is no craze from your speech. This is the There's only no? question. There is no? No craze from your speech. There's no craze. craze. The brother asked a question that those who understand English, they, they have craze from my lecture, they desire to hear my lecture. Those who don't understand, they don't desire. Brother, my job is not that people should desire to hear my lecture. My job is to spread Islam in the best way possible. What I said today in India, there are hundreds of ulama who know Urdu. Hundreds you have. If I speak in Urdu, I'll be another drop in the ocean. How many people speak in English? So whatever the requirement is, I should fulfill. I don't say speaking in Urdu is wrong. It's good, Alhamdulillah. But those who say that Urdu is the Islamic language, I disagree with them. Arabic is the Islamic language. And I've given the talk, Al-Quran should be read with understanding. Arabic is the Islamic language. After Arabic, if you say Urdu is the second Islamic language, I disagree. Any other language after Arabic has equal value. In India, people know more Hindi, more Urdu. I'm for it that more people should speak in Urdu and Hindi. But I, brother, speak more outside India than India. I'm a person who prefers doing dawah on international level. Now, internationally, English can be understood more than Urdu. Alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, the programs of mine are shown on the satellite in hundreds of countries in the world. If I speak in Urdu, it will be limited to India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, maybe. Not outside that. So those who speak in Urdu, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, they are doing that job. Everyone cannot become a doctor. If everyone becomes a doctor, if you say doctor is a good profession, everyone becomes a doctor, who will be an engineer? Who will build the house? So we require some people to become doctors, some people engineers. So similarly, some speak in Hindi, some speak in Urdu. All languages are good, Alhamdulillah. But the language is most important in Arabic. After that, all are equal. So I, brother, since my education is more in English, in public lectures, I prefer speaking English. On an individual level, when I speak with non-Muslims and Muslims, I speak in Urdu, I speak in Hindi, a little bit broken other languages also. But in public, when I speak, I have more command. I can think more faster in that language. Therefore, I'm more comfortable with English, and there's no harm if I stick to that, because I feel that the need today in India and in the world is more of English speakers as compared to Urdu speakers. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, my name is Zubair. Uh, we have heard in the hadith that the length of the beard of Hazrat Prophet should be more than one fist, used to be more than one fist long. Today, when I decide to keep a beard, should the length of my beard also necessarily be that long, or is it okay if I have an identity as a beard? The question you ask. 
Weird. If you decide to keep a beard, alhamdulillah, I congratulate you that I've decided to keep a beard, alhamdulillah. The brother said that, what should the length of my beard be? And some people said it should be like a fist. What is the real thing? Brother, it is the command of the beloved prophet that do the opposite of what the pagans do, mushrik do. Keep the beard and trim the mustache short. The commandment of the prophet is keep a beard. It's a fard to keep a beard. Fard. Now, if you have more taqwa and want to do more in research, you can go on a higher level. That offering five times salah is a fard. With your fard salah, you can offer sunnat al mawqida, sunnat alhamdulillah. If you ask me what is minimum, minimum is offering salah five times. Along with it, if you offer sunnat al mawqida, alhamdulillah. If you offer sunnat, alhamdulillah. Tajjud, alhamdulillah. Vitar, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So the commandment of the prophet is keep a beard. Now, when a prophet gives a commandment, if you look at his lifestyle and the lives of the sahabas, you get more details of that commandment. So minimum commandment is keep a beard, alhamdulillah. So first, I only stress on keeping a beard. But if you want to have higher level of taqwa, that I want to go in more details. Besides the commandment, I also want to follow the lifestyle of the sahabas and the prophet, summa, alhamdulillah. In the hadith I quoted of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of dress, chapter 64, hadith number 78 says that Nafi narrated, may Allah be pleased with him, that Ibn Umar, the son of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the pagans do, keep the beard and trim the mustaches, cut the mustaches short. And the hadith continues, and Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, the son of Umar, after Hajj and Umrah, he got the beard with his fist and trimmed what was below his hold. Whatever was below his hold, he trimmed it. Now, keeping a beard is a commandment of the Prophet. Now, the Sahaba are the best people to know what the Prophet meant. So, if you follow the lifestyle of the Sahaba, it is much better. So, if you ask me keeping a beard, most of the scholars say that since the Prophet command, it's a fard. Now, if you want to have a higher level of taqwa, what is mustahab? What should be the length of the beard? I quoted the hadith which says that Ibn Umar, how did he trim his beard? Held the beard with his fist and, you know, there is hair below. So whatever is below, you can see, my beard is very sparse. You can't demonstrate very well with my beard. But, you know, Alhamdulillah, it is one mutti. So you trim it below that. There are more than 10 hadith which tell that the sahabas, they cut it this way. There are several other hadith, for example, the next hadith of Sahih Bukhari, Poem number seven in the book of dress, chapter number 65, hadith number 781. Ibn Omar, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet said, cut your mustaches short and leave the beard. Best is first keep a beard. If you're on high level of taqwa, you can keep the size of one fist, but minimum at least first keep a beard. And then inshallah, if Allah gives more that, and if you have more taqwa, and if you say, I want to follow more of the sahabas, because if you want to analyze any Sahih hadith, the best way to analyze is to see how the sahabas understood the hadith. They are the best people. They were the companions of the prophet. So if you see their lifestyle, how do they trim the mustaches? Trim the mustaches means you can't have long mustaches. When you drink tea, some tea also gets stuck on the mustaches. Unhygienic. Unhygienic. So trimming the mustaches. If you go to the lifestyle of the Sahaba, the Sahih Hadith, it says that how did the Sahaba trim the mustaches? Also, it's mentioned. They trimmed it in such a way that the skin of the upper lip was seen. Higher level of taqwa. But if you want to go more into detail, the Sahaba trimmed the mustaches in such a way that the skin below the mustaches was seen. So if you have more taqwa, you want to keep the mustaches in a more better way, then this is the style. But first, at least keep the beard trim the mustaches, then inshallah Allah gives you that. You can follow the level which you feel is the best for you. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. May we have the next question from the sister section, please. In your talk in the beginning, you mentioned that we should pray salutations to every Muslim that we meet. Now, if, for example, I was to go to the market and I see my Muslim brothers, young and old, am I permitted by Islam to greet them this is a very good question. I said the Quran mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 54, that وَإِذَا جَاءَقَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِعَيَاتِينَ فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ That when those come to thee, when those come to thee, 
who believe in our signs, wish them assalamu alaikum. The Quranic verse says, when those come to thee, when they approach thee, then salam becomes a fard. Now when you go in the marketplace, I, as a Muslim man, go, even if they don't come to me, I wish them for salam, because the Prophet said, we well, wish salam, it's better to spread salam. But you as a Muslim, a Muslim woman, you have to even maintain your hijab. And for hijab, there are various verses given in the Quran as well as Sahih Hadith. If you read Surah Azab chapter number 33, verse number 32, it says that a special verse has been revealed to the wives of the Prophet saying that be not too complacent in your voice, lest in the opposite person in whose heart is a disease, they may misunderstand you. Means for the wives of the Prophet, they could not be too complacent. You know, oh, assalamu alaikum. You have to maintain your hijab. Hijab is also of the voice. So as a gender rule sister, you as being opposite sex, you need not wish every Muslim that you see on the road who does not approach you. When I go to the market, if I see a Muslim, a Muslim woman, and who just passing me, I will not wish the salam. If she approaches me and there are certain problems that she requires help, etc., I maintain my hijab, I lower my gaze, etc., and follow. But normally if they don't approach, it's not compulsory. For the same sex, for letting peace spread on the world, Alhamdulillah, I will try and wish to even a person who doesn't approach me. So you, sister, to the opposite sex, it's not a requirement that you should wish to every Muslim brother, young or old that you meet. If you know, if he is a mahram, your father or your son or your husband, then it's preferable. If anyone approaches you, you should meet. Now regarding the question, if suppose a person, if a Muslim, wishes you assalamu alaikum, how should you respond as a Muslim? First, you should realize that if there is a requirement for the Muslim man, who's a nahmaram of yours, to talk to you, then can the discussion proceed. If you think it's not a requirement, you need not proceed with the discussion. You need not proceed. If you know that this particular boy is from your college, and unnecessarily, he wants to talk to you, then you have to maintain your hijab. You need not talk to him also. Because his intentions aren't good. But if you know that the intention is good, and suppose opposite sex approaches, you give the reply, but not too complacent. Not say, oh, walaikum as -salam. It's not a requirement. You have to maintain your hijab. Walaikum salam, be firm, so that if there's a disease in the heart of the opposite person, it will not be increased. That is the guidance of the Quran. So sister, where Nahmeram gent is concerned for a woman, and where a Namera woman is concerned for a gent, you should maintain the Islamic hijab. And as the sister said earlier, that there are some men who look at the women who don't do hijab. The Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 30, before it speaks about the hijab for the woman, it says, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That means whenever a man Whenever a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. This is the hijab for the Muslim. So if a Muslim man looks at a woman, irrespective whether she's a Muslim or non-Muslim, he cannot feast on her. So sister said there are Muslim boys who look at non-Muslim and get married to them. They aren't following the Quran. They aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Once there was a friend of mine who was a Muslim, who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? Why are you staring at a girl for a long time? So he told me, our beloved prophet said that the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not yet completed half my glance. What did the prophet mean when he said that the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited? It doesn't mean that you can look at a woman, stare at her for a long time without blinking for 10 minutes and say that I'm following the prophet. What the Prophet meant that unintentionally if you look at a woman, don't intentionally look at her to feast on her. So similarly, sister, it's not a requirement that you greet every Nahmeram Muslim man that you meet. But if they approach you, depending upon the situation, you have to give the reply based on Quran and Sahih Hadith. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the President. Uh, I am Nuruddin. Uh, sir, uh, in Islam, Parda. Uh, what I mean to say is um, uh, the husband or the, or the father or the brother, can he, uh, is uh, the Quran or the Hadith authorizing him to enforce parda on 
the sister or the daughter can he uh, take a whip so to say in his hand and enforce it if uh, the girl or his wife or his sister is unwilling to observe parda so we asked the question that can a father a husband or a brother force a woman the sister the daughter etc to practice parda if they don't wish to follow hijab can he force but naturally the duty of every muslim to islah and especially among the close relatives he should try his level best to convince first with hikma quotation of the quran with reason logic that you should do hijab regarding forcing what is permitted within limits what is permitted i'm not using the word force i'm using the word enforce can he enforce it through other means uh, that's right the brother said he's not using the word force he's using the word enforce i'm giving a broader answer so that the next question should not ask what about force even when force is concerned within limits when enforce by other means he should do it by other means like economic means you know say i am your father i am giving you pocket money you know you go to college you don't do the hijab i will stop giving you pocket money putting putting economic pressure alam you should do it why not he should so enforce by other means he should do it and if there are certain things the quran gives permission at certain times to even put little force within limits the limits are prescribed in the quran say hadith that if you know using little force can enforce a person doing fard like offering salah a parent is allowed to use a little bit force on the children for offering salah it's a fard you know very required within limits so similarly for enforcing hijab husband can say okay i will stop giving you so and so things because we don't do hijab he can and he should when enforcement is concerned first with hikma in good ways Odu ila sabir abbi kabhi hikma with wisdom and beautiful preaching. If that doesn't work, you can use enforcement, like using pressure. I will not talk to you. I will not like it. And whatever you feel within limits is best. You should. And every Muslim or every Muslima, if for example the husband is not offering salah, the wife can say that she offering salah as a fard. She can use tactics like certain pressurization. So these can be used by both man as well as woman on the spouse, on the relatives, so that a person becomes a good Muslim. If it's a fard, which a person is not doing, they can very well pressurize. Even a woman can pressurize the husband for keeping a beard. <laughs> normal people only, people normally pose only. The husband can pressurize the woman. Why can't the woman do that to the husband? Ah, sometimes the wife may say, "Oh, don't keep a beard; it pokes." So we have to tell them. Maybe it pokes. Inshallah, if you are finding discomfort here in the akhirah, you'll get more comfort. You know there are ways in satisfying. So whoever is on the wrong track, it is the duty because the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse number one hundred eighty-seven, "Hunna libasul lakum, wantum libasul lahunna." That you are the garments, and they are your garments. The husband and wife, the garments unto one another, and they should see to it that both of them stay on the sirat al-mustaqim. Hope that answers the question. Uh, may we have the next question, please? on this side yeah assalamu alaikum my name is sayyed shahab ali and i am a student of degree college uh, i i have heard that it has been scientifically proved that there are some sign there are some benefits of uh, putting cap and sporting a beard may i know what's that there was asked a question that he has heard that there are certain benefits scientific benefits for wearing a cap and sporting a beard what are they yes there are many benefits and you can give a list of benefits like if you wear a cap it protects you from sun from a sunstroke you have less chance of having sunstroke if it drizzles a little bit your head doesn't get wet there are various benefits for keeping a beard what are the scientific benefits there was the latest research done that those men who keep a beard and wash it regularly they have less chances of having upper respiratory tract infection infection of the lung of the throat etc but if you keep a beard and don't wash it regularly there are more chances of you having upper respiratory tract infection so the research says that those men who keep a beard and offer salah you know do wudu you have to do wudu before salah minimum 5 times a day you wash it 
Alhamdulillah, there are less chances that you'll have upper respiratory tract infection. There are various benefits. But a Muslim, like it's Salah, there are various benefits. But a Muslim, most of the Muslim, they wear the cap and keep the beard. Why? Atiullah wa atir Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the messenger. If Allah commands you, whether there are scientific benefits or not, amanna saddaqna. I hear and affirm. I'm a person who believes. So mainly we keep it because it's a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This lecture was just trying to convince those people who may not have that much faith. So just because the Quran says, I follow it. Just because the Hadith says, I follow it. We have to give other logical reason to convince them. So these scientific reasons may help, may help those Muslims who are on the brim. It may help these scientific reasons, these benefits. But the main thing is, if the label shows your intent, you wear it. The next question from the sister's section, please. Assalamu alaikum. I wanted to put a further question regarding the label for women. Like, for example, for the school girls going especially to the convent schools, there uh, we are not permitted to wear burqa. So what would you say in regarding this condition? The sister asked a question that regarding Muslim women, Muslim girls going to convent schools, they aren't allowed to wear burqa. So what is my advice? Sister, burqa becomes a fard on a lady after she reaches maturity, after she becomes malik. Before that, it's optional. So after you reach a certain age, whether it be 12, 13, whatever it is, it becomes a fard. Before that, it's optional. Regarding wearing burqa to school, sister, you can very well send the children or send the young girls to a single sex school, which are only for girls. So where is the question of doing hijab? you can send to a school which is only having girl students. So immediately the requirement of hijab is not there. So if they study in a school which is only for girls, there's no problem at all. And I know several Muslim women who go to such convent schools, who go to such convent schools, in which they wear the hijab, the burqa, and inside the ladies' room, they remove it, and they comfortably live in the school, which is only meant for the girls. I would not advise you to put your children in a co-ed school because there it will be difficult. You know, difficult for them to maintain the hijab, not only of the clothes, even of other things. Therefore, it's preferably that you put your children, the boys in boys' school and girls in girls' school, not in a co-ed school. And if the situation arises that your children is in a co-ed school and suppose the teacher doesn't give permission, what do you do? You change your school. If you cannot live in a land and cannot practice Islam, you do hijrah. So if you cannot practice Islam, which is a farth for the Muslim woman to maintain the hijab, you change your school, sister. That's the best for you. Hope that answers the question. Uh, brother, I'm a new reverter Muslim. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me chance to put a Muslim name. He says, live as a Muslim. If you want to live, uh, live as a Muslim, if you want to die, die as a Muslim to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallam and book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran. Brother, I am a short uh, on visit uh, to Bombay. I have visited several places in Bombay and several mosques. I have noticed Muslim brothers. Sometimes I feel very pity. When I have seen coming out from the mosque, mashallah, uh, growing a big uh, beard, and when they come out from the mosque holding a cigarette and eating a pan, which is look like uh, oil paint, and the smoking like a blowing balloon. How do you feel the non-Muslim brother as a priest the Islam? I suppose the question that when he goes to many mosques, he sees that Muslims when they come out, they smoke cigarette and they eat pan, it looks bad. What is the opinion? Is it right or wrong? First, whether is cigarette smoking allowed or not? And there are various fatwas given. Previously, the ulama used to give a fatwa. It is makhru, based on the knowledge that they had. But today, science is advanced, and the scholars have changed their opinion. Based on the Quranic verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 195, which says that do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction. Do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction. According to latest research, it tells us today that According to the World Health Organization, there are more than a million people every year who only die because of cigarette smoking. 
out of the 90% of the people that die due to lung disease, due to lung cancer, is due to cigarette smoking. Out of the 70% of the people that die because of bronchitis, die because they smoke cigarettes. Out of the 25% who die because of cardiovascular disease, is because they smoke cigarettes. It is nothing but slow poisoning. Cigarette contains nicotine and tar. Leave aside how it looks. Leave aside how it looks. According to the latest fatwas given by more than 400 ulamas, they say cigarette smoking is haram because the Quran says, do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction. And not only does it harm you, it even harm your neighbor. Because the research tells us today that the wives of the chain smokers, they have more chances of having lung cancer because passive smoking is more dangerous. Active smoking directly is harmful. Passive smoking means the smoke which you exhale out, and if somebody else inhales that, it is more dangerous. There are various ill effects. When you smoke, it causes blackening of the lips, blackening of the teeth, damage to the gums, blackening of the fingers, it damages the throat, it causes peptic ulcer, it causes constipation, it causes loss of libido, it causes loss of vigor, the person's appetite is gone, it even causes loss of memory. So based on all these researches, today's ulama, there are more than 400 fatwas given saying that cigarette smoking is haram. According to the Quranic verse, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 195, which says, do not make your own hand the cause of your own destruction. So irrespective of whether it looks good or not, it is not allowed in Islam. Regarding having pan, etc., pan per se, if it contains tobacco, Tobacco in any form, whether smoking, whether hookah, whether chewing, is as good as slow poisoning, which is haram. Otherwise, otherwise the pan doesn't contain tobacco, only contains supari. It may look bad, that's a different thing. But Islam, Islam doesn't have any prohibition. It may be harmful for the health. The doctor may say, don't indulge in having pan. It may cause loss to your teeth, your gums may get spoiled. That's a different issue. But where Islam is concerned, tobacco in any form is prohibited. Hope that answers the question. This is Muhammad Rafiq. And my question is, uh, is it compulsory for a Muslim man to wear his trousers above the ankle? And is that a label? Brother, that's a very good question. That is it compulsory for a Muslim man to wear his trousers above the ankle? And is it a label? The best answer is Quran and Sahih Hadith. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of death, chapter number four. It says that the Prophet said that the part of the trouser that hangs below the ankle, that part will be in the hellfire. Following that, there are additional five or six Hadith. Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, book of death, chapter number five. It says that anyone who walks arrogantly with his trousers hanging on the ground, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will curse him. So it is a commandment of the Prophet that any part of the trouser that goes below the ankle, it should be above the ankle. It's a requirement. Any part that goes below the ankle, it is prohibited according to the beloved Prophet. You ask me, is it a label? Yes, I would say it's part of the label may not be a very identical label as compared to the cap and the beard, because not that you have to always look at the trousers, but it is a label, and if you have more taqwa, and if a person follows this, it is alhamdulillah. A person who has more taqwa, who wants to follow the commandment of the beloved prophet, therefore you find that those who are more in the hadith, they see to it that they keep their trousers above the ankle. You can call it a label, it may not be as significant as the beard or the cap, which you can see from even a distance. You know, from here I can see, Alhamdulillah. Trousers, I may not be able to see. But if you say it's a label, I've got no objection considering even that to be a label. The last question from the sisters section, please. Assalamu alaikum. And a question is, is it compulsory for a non-Muslim to change his or her name before he or she accepts Islam? The question posed by the sisters is, is it compulsory?